My name is Charles Cobb, and I'm president of Disrupt DC, and very honored to be here with our distinguished panel. Uh, just a few, couple of introductory remarks. The panel is on individualism, humanities, and education. Martin Luther's act 500 years ago today launched one of the greatest disruptions in the Western world. The posting of his 95 theses also coincided with the dramatic rise of the use of the printing press, what might be considered the internet or social media of the 16th century. Luther was a prolific writer, and according to his new biographer, Lindell, Lindell Roper at Oxford, between 1500 and 1530, Martin Luther's writings alone constituted 20% of the books that were published in Germany. So I see an empowering, transformative arc between 1517 and 2017. Both the printing press and the internet transformed, informed, disrupted, and empowered individuals, institutions, entire societies. The printing press and the internet have also impacted education, and they have implications for the continued study of the humanities. And I think the question is whether the internet and social media together have raised concerns about whether we will actually have the patience and the habits of mind, the habits of reflection, to absorb the lessons afforded by the deep study of the humanities. As the pianist and conductor David Baum, uh, Barenboim said recently, the real evil of the world can only be fought with a humanism that keeps us all together. And so on the topic of humanism, we move directly to Professor Peter Pazzalini, who's a senior scholar here at Columbia at the Heyman Center for the Humanities. He has taught, I understand, the core studies in the core studies program for many decades. He's taught uh, contemporary civilization at uh, Columbia. So Peter, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. I'm old school. Yes, Peter Pasolini um, from the Latin Pazzainus and the Romanian dialect Pazzain, which means trickster, jester, fool. And I understand if the fool persists in his folly, he will become wise. And perhaps this will happen to me today. I shall speak on education and the humanities, the Columbia core, and what it means to be human. I'm dedicating uh, this short talk to William Theodore de Berry, my mentor and friend. A uh, former provost, noted educator, and alumnus of Columbia University. Professor de Berry received the National Humanities Medal from former President Barack Obama. He established the Asian Studies program at Columbia, which became a worldwide <coughs> model, and taught up to his death near the age of 98. Professor de, de Berry also founded the Hyman Center for the Humanities at Columbia and helped to endow all of its programs. Aristotle would have been proud of him. Professor de Berry lived the good life, the well-lived life, an exemplar of human flourishing. Please note the East Asian artifacts um, that are in this room. A Chinese vessel in the form of an owl, in the last case to the right, from the Han Dynasty, 200 BC to 220 AD, and this lion from the Song Dynasty, 900 to 1250 AD. These cultural artifacts form part of the Sackler collections, a generous gift to the university. May the owl give us its wisdom and the lion its courage today so that we can say with Reinhold Niebuhr, may we be granted the serenity to accept the things we cannot change and the courage to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. My remarks this afternoon will focus on how the humanities or the studia humanitatis help us to understand what it means to be human. To even ask this question is to be human. Education is the midwife or the ars maiutica for the young, pregnant with possibility when they are born again through careful thought and deep reflection and the immense power of Socratic dialectic, especially in the Columbia Corps. I have taught in the Corps for many years and know this to be true from lived experience in the humanities. We shall celebrate the 100th anniversary of contemporary civilization, the oldest track of the Columbia Corps in 2019. 
1919, the faculty proposed the course, and in September of that year, contemporary civilization commenced. There are many voices describing what it means to be human in these core texts, and we should listen to all of them, especially through the voices of our students. However, today, given the constraints of time, let us at least hear some of these core voices through my own. From the Hebrew Bible, Ecclesiastes 3, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, and a time for war and a time for peace. This eloquent voice of the prophet from Ecclesiastes captures what it means to be human. We humans navigate these op oppositional forces between birth and death. It is the paradox of our creation, the journey of the fool within us. Many great philosophical systems confront our mortality, which still lies at 100% when the world becomes short of breath for all of us. Despite the dreams of transhumanists, genetic engineers, and technological triumphalists, which brings up Aristotle's observation from the metaphysics that everyone by nature desires to know. Two great myths from the Columbia Corps, Genesis 3, the perilous garden of the tree of knowledge, and the myth of Prometheus, warn us about our desire to know, which can, through greed and arrogance, cross boundaries. Both myths carry a similar message. We pay a price for plucking fruit from the tree of knowledge or stealing fire from Zeus. They are always, there are always consequences, known and unknown, perceived and lived. We cannot put the fruit back on the tree, or nor can we return the stolen fire to Zeus. Our original sin lies in losing intimacy with the divine, thereby constricting our unbounded awareness. Did we divorce the Holy One, or did the Holy One divorce us? Nevertheless, like Odysseus, we remain curious, seek adventure, wonder, explore frontiers, yet hope for a safe return to Ithaca, our home, where there is the love of family and friends, and we hope to do so without renouncing ourself and the world. However, our insatiable curiosity and desire have placed us and our planet in great peril. We now face two great challenges, nuclear war or accident and environmental collapse. We now have the power to destroy ourselves and all life. 500 years ago, Martin Luther proclaimed in his disputation against scholastic theology that humans are by nature unable to want God to be God. Indeed, they want to be God and do not want God to be God. A thesis well stated, Martin Luther. Let us also recall that the Hindus, when they build a temple, leave one corner unfinished. Only the gods make something perfect. Man never can. It is much, much better to know that one is not perfect then one feels much better. In short, our pretense of absolute knowledge becomes ignorance. Marcus du Satoy, professor of public understanding of science at Oxford, in his recent book, The Great Unknown, agrees with Emile de Bois-Raymond of the Berlin Academy that the following list of questions appears beyond the limits of human knowledge, with some progress made regarding the origin of life. The great unknowns are the following. One, the ultimate nature of matter and force. Two, the origin of motion. Three, the origin of life with some progress to date. Four, the apparent teleological arrangements of nature. 
Five, the origins of simple sensations. Six, the origins of simple thought and language. And seven, the question of free will. Ironically, the more we expand the circle or map of our knowledge, the more we don't know. For a good dose of humility, we should read or reread Ecclesiastes. All, for all is vanity and the chasing after wind, for the making of books there is no end. The book of Job also explores the frail and heroic features of our humanity, accepting incomprehensibility and not knowing. In the end, perhaps like Dylan Thomas, we should rage, rage against the dying of the light. But in the end, time is undefeated. In the end, time defeats everyone, and then there will be time for everything. Furthermore, let us not impart undigested knowledge to others, since there is great danger of your spewing out what you have not digested, says Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher, another Columbia Corps author. Robert Sapolsky, professor of biology and neurology at Stanford, observes in his new book, Behave, that the certainty with which we act now might seem ghastly, not solely to future generations, but to our future selves as well. My 97-year-old Italian mother, who just had a birthday on Saturday, always says to me, chi va piano va sano e va lontano, ma quasi mai allieve, meaning whoever goes slowly goes in a healthy way and farther, but hardly ever without distress or suffering. No one has a corner on suffering. It is part of life and one of the central themes of the Columbia Corps. We suffer in our bodies, as part of nature and because of other people. A, as you well know, we also suffer over the suffering of others, a very primal emotion often observed in the more than human world. Suffering makes us more human and brings us back to rock bottom emotional and physical states. Events beyond our control force us down, down from pride, down from arrogance, down from self-importance, down from senseless chatter to silence. when we are in immediate contact with reality and revelation. Perhaps Hobbes, another core author, was right. Words are the money of fools. Everything is a metaphor, whether a word or thing, for the unseen, the unpredictable, and the incomprehensible, observes Augustine. Ultimately, words cannot measure our suffering. All languages merged into crying at Auschwitz. Suffering is in our biological nature, in our cultural world, the genetics and epigenetics of our life that co-evolve with each other. Freud, yet another core author, clearly knew the sources of suffering in the social contract between the individual and society when he observes in his seminal volume, Civilization and <coughs> Its Discontents, the following. Quote, the replacement of the power of the individual by the power of a community constitutes the decisive step of civilization. The essence of it lies in the fact that the members of the community restrict themselves in their possibilities of satisfaction, whereas the individual knew no such restrictions." End of quote. Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Smith, Hume, Kant, Darwin, Nietzsche, Mill, Berlin, and Rawls, among other core authors, all confront this theme. We can develop a social science approach to this thematic arc with Marx, Engels, Durkheim, Weber, and Mannheim as well. Humans are either elevated or subordinated by ideology, political, religious, and cultural, and by social economic status across the globe. The response to the question, what does it mean to be human, is complicated. However, asking the right question is half the answer. What are we striving for and moving away from? Who are we? What do we want to be? What should we do? Are we left with disorientation, the mood of ancient Greek tragedy? Individuals and societies are judged by what they strive for, said the North African Berber Augustine of Hippo. From the grave does Pericles, the Athenian statesman in general, warn us not to overextend our empire. Perhaps we can say with Terence, the ancient Roman playwright, another North African of Berber descent, 
and a favorite of Martin Luther. Homo sum humani nihil a me alienum puto. I am human. I think nothing human, alien from me, to me. What horses are pulling us, individually and collectively, in our Greek or Roman chariots? The horse of reason? The horse of emotion and desire? The horse of instinct? The horse of sensation and intuition? Do we even have the reins? Are these horses in alignment or running in different directions? Are we able to name and unite unconscious desire with conscious intent when making choices which always shift within a changing context and over time and space? Life is change. Life is choice. Life is chance. We are still evolving, and the present is the point of power. In Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl states, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Do we fully understand that our freedom lies in this space between stimulus and response? Education in the humanities helps us to make powerful and prudent choices within that space between stimulus and response with a broad and deep historical knowledge and self-knowledge, enveloped by ethics, values, and virtues, and always open to the insights and contributions of the social and natural sciences. We get to choose between eros and thanatos, the life instinct and the death instinct. We get to choose between altruism and egoism, the two layers of our biological evolution. The Stoics were right. In the end, all is connected. All human be beings belong to one city, the world. The French Enlightenment philosophers were right. There is an underlying unity to all knowledge. Neuroscientists are right when they observe that there is a strange similarity between human neuron and galaxy networks. Let us hope with Pandora that education in the arts and sciences, stolen by Prometheus from Athena, will not leave us alone with our philosophical melancholy, like Rodin's thinker, and that she, Athena, our alma mater, on the steps of Lone Memorial, will allow us to see the light in the form of the good, beauty, and truth, as she emerges as our alma redemptoris mater, our nourishing mother of redemption. Then we can say, all of us with uplifting voices, illuminate tuo vide bimis lumen, in thy light shall we see light. And I might add, where there is light, there is hope. Thank you. Peter, thank you. It is clear why your students have loved you for so many decades. And I'd like to take the course right now. But thank, thank you. Um, let's welcome next Mark Berner, who is the CEO and co-chairman of TELOS. Mark is an attorney, an entrepreneur, an investor, an expert on philanthropy. He is a passionate education reformer, and I'm pleased to call him a friend, Mark Berner. Um, Twelve years ago, um, I found myself in Blackwell's bookstore in Oxford, a legendary bookstore. And when, if you're like me, when you wander into it, if you're a reader and you like books, you look at the table near the door, the, the new releases, and there was a book there by a man whom I did not know at the time. I've subsequently gotten the name Martin Rees. It was called Our Final Century. That struck me as odd in Blackwell's. It I thought it was some book about, by some sort of addle-brained um, California fundamentalist about the end of the world. And so curiosity got the better of me, and I grabbed the book, and I took it off the, the table, and I looked at it, and I said, huh, Martin Rees. No, he's not an addle-brained California fundamentalist. He's the Astronomer Royal. He's the president of Trinity College, Cambridge. He's uh, the head of the Royal Society. He's Lord Rees. My interest was piqued. I bought the book. And um, it was Rees writing in his capacity as a public intellectual. And um, he made more or less this case. The first half of the book was looking at the 21st century uh, from the perspective of the head of the Royal Society. What innovations can we expect in science and technology? And what will they mean for the human race? And it was broadly, if not enthusiastically, optimistic. 
Um, the last half of the book, however, was uh, he looked at the dystopian implications of those same technologies and science. And he concludes the book by more or less, you know, if you think about it, a graphing the, well, he concludes the book by giving our species a 50% chance of surviving the 21st century. And he, he makes the point that if you were to, and the reason he gave, if you were to graph um, on an X and Y axis, uh, sort of our, the, the rate of innovation and change and our capacity for moral reflection, they're going in the opposite directions. Um, and, uh, and he was concerned about that, that we were losing a common language, a common grammar, by which to even disagree. That got me thinking about what do we have, you know, what, what, what common grammar do we have, and it's Athens and Jerusalem, you know, it's, it's the great tradition. And that, as a business person and as a lawyer and other things, uh, kind of got me interested in this, and I sort of followed my nose and ended up here at Columbia working with people in the core and folks at Yale and elsewhere, um, and got me taking a, and look, a looking at higher education, and, um, but as a and also, I have to say that I was trained in the great tradition. I credit my training in college and university at Yale and Oxford with changing my life. These are, these are things that occupy me. I don't watch Netflix. I read Aristotle, you know, not all the time, but, you know, I would sort of prefer to do that or if I don't, I feel guilty. Um, so I began to ask these questions. I was kind of concerned about what's going on in higher education as I hung around academics and talked about it and learned, for example, here at, at about that time, McKinsey had, um, was hired by the administration of Columbia University to do a study of the uh, overview of the curriculum and, and, and try to rationalize it. And they recommended getting rid of the core. I'm told that the report was buried at that point. But see, that's, that's a sort of, sort of the, 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 the sort of instrumental rationale that drives a certain approach to higher education. It's inefficient to do what Peter does. It's inefficient, um, and yet it's, it's what defines most Columbia graduates, is what most Columbia graduates remember no matter what their major. So higher education is under attack, the core is under attack, liberal education is under attack. But I want to suggest in the remaining time I have to take a look at actually the kind of the business side of that, and what does that mean, and where are we? Try to locate this conversation in, in something approaching reality. I told Ned before I started, I'm going to take the, follow the adage of my contracts professor in law school who said, just remember, Mark, whatever you, whatever else happens to the laws, whatever is boldly stated and plausibly maintained. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be, try to boldly state this. I don't know how plausible it will be. So a couple of statistics. Um, the last hundred years, higher education is democratized, but it remains stratified by economic and social class. These are um, statistics from the U.S. government. Um, for, it's 100 years ago it catered to the elites, but it's been democratized. Um, uh, but most students then as now do not receive a liberal education. In 1917, 9% uh, of the population received a bachelor degree. Today it's 32.5%. The institutions of higher learning in the last 100 years have grown from 980 to over 4,700. Uh, 4, uh, but the economic and social differential remains and by some measures is increasing. 60% of students in the United States graduate within six years. It's lowered institutions that educate uh, low SES or poorer students. It's CUNY, it's 44%. Um, a lower percentage of needy students attend selective colleges like Columbia than they did in 1980. Uh, public universities have decreased the aid to needy students by 27% and increased aid to upper middle class students by 43% since 1996. It's called income leveraging to those of you in the financial services business. Um, this, this stratification I'm going to argue is likely to increase rather than decrease um, and let me explain why I think that's the case. There's been a marked decline in quality intergenerationally in all academic sectors. I'm just going to refer to one study, uh, well known to probably many of you, but there are others. Richard Aram, late of NYU, now at the dean of the University of uh, California Irvine School of Education, wrote several books, Academically Adrift and others. He did a longitudinal study of over 2,000 students at a range of college and university, selective and non-selective, and the results were more or less the same. Some of his key findings um, 
weak curriculum across the board. 20 only 20 percent of American students take five or fewer or more, five or fewer courses that require 40 pages of reading in their entire academic career. Poor study habits. College students study less than they did in high school, and 50 percent less than their parents did. What are the results? Um, this is, this is to me is the most shocking. Richard s says that um, one third of the students and these measures they were uh, developed for the Social Science Research Council think critical thinking, analytical reasoning, writing, and numeracy. A third actually declined in college. They went down. A third stayed the same and a third went up. But the third that went up went up at one standard deviation less than their parents, which means, and I'll, I'll let the Nobel um, laureates, correct me if I'm wrong here, that you have a one-third chance of learning, or one-third one chance of learning half as much as your parents did. And this is across the board at elite institutions as well as non-elite institutions. Um, and one of the other interesting things that I think is, some, we should pay attention to this, those of, who, those of us who care about liberal education, uh, and this was in the footnotes in Richard's work, but I think is significant. He actually looked at college majors and how they performed according to these metrics. He discovered that those who majored in business, in teaching, and in communication scored lowest. Those who majored in traditional liberal arts were the highest. So moms and dads across the country are telling their kids, I don't care what you study in college, just study business, is the wrong answer. Um, and I'll give you more data on that in a moment. Um, so that's decline in quality. The second, and I'm going to be brief here, uh, is a dramatic increase in cost. A couple of statistics. Um, you're familiar with them, but let me just situate us in this. Adjusted for inflation, tuition and fees have increased 7.45% annually since 1978 versus 5.8% for healthcare and 3.8% for the consumer price index. Those numbers are about a year too old, but they're more or less correct, directionally correct. Um, pub public support for uh, higher education has declined 25% since 2008, and it, in my view will likely decline further when the tsunami of unfunded p uh, municipal pension liabilities uh, hits us in about three to five years. Um, we're going to have Detroit's probably in Stockton's all over the country. And this will affect higher education because higher education is need is nice to have, not need to have if you're a state legislator. The defaults are rising. 31 percent are del currently delinqu uh, are delinquent. 13 percent are in default. Um, and uh, as we know, student debt is not dischargeable in bankruptcy. It follows you around for the rest of your life. And there are a number of studies in the New York Fed most recently suggest that this is affecting things like marriage rates and home ownership and entrepreneurship. Um, an increase in professionalism is a third factor I'd want to highlight here. Risk aversion. I'm going to be somewhat anecdotal here. A college classmate of mine is the director of admissions at Yale, and she told me recently that for the last four classes, on average, the admitted students to Yale College, 65% say they want to be STEM majors. And yet I think only something like 18 or 20 percent of future jobs are going to be in STEM. What does that tell you? Even students at Yale College are frightened for their future. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was visiting with Stan McChrystal, who teaches part-time at Yale, the former general. He teaches a leadership class to under, select undergraduates and graduates. And um, I happened to walk into his office just after he came back from teaching, and he had this epiphany. Something had been bothering him for the last several years, and he couldn't figure out what it was. And uh, he just discovered and wanted to tell someone, and I happened to be the guy. And he said, you know, when I, when I lecture, unlike what I'm doing, I, 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 I walk around. You know, I, 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 I move back and forth. He said, I have these, this group of students in front of me, year in and year out, and they're, they're uniformly bright, hardworking, conscientious, clever, ambitious. But something bothered me about all of them. Every class, and I couldn't figure out what it was, and I just did. And I said, well, Stan, what was it? And he said, they never took their eyes off of me. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, I'll tell you what it means. It means that they're trying to figure out what I want, and they're going to give it to me. And I said, let me tell you why that's a problem. He said, I graduated from West Point in 1975 or 76. He said, this was after we had gotten, um, I was going to use a colorful phrase, I won't. We, were gotten, we had performed badly as the US Army in Vietnam. <laughs> and, um, and he said, so we, did, we became risk averse the Powell Doctrine. 
and over, only overwhelming force would, it, we would deploy forces only if we had an overwhelming force and we could win, which was the first Gulf War. He so said that worked fine in the first Gulf War. The second Gulf War, not so fine. I, and, I inherited, you know, the, 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 the troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. We were getting, if, can I say this, Ned, our asses kicked by the, that's, what, that was, that's quoting Stan, actually. That's not, it's kind of military language, I guess. He said, I didn't know what to do. And he said, we had to change what we were doing on the fly. It's like changing a tire at 50 miles an hour because our doctrine was wrong. The problem is the world is changing quickly. Society is changing quickly. And if we're developing the finest students who are, who are risk averse, um, they're anti-fragile. Uh, they're not going to be able to adapt to change and risk. And, and this is the concern that I, Stan, have. And I, it, I, a week later, I found myself back here, and I talked to Roosevelt Montes, who runs the Corps here, and I said, you've been teaching here for 15 or 20 years. Has this been your experience? He said, yep. And I talk, took a kid up to Cornell for a college interview, and speaking to another friend of mine, Kent Fox, who was then the, the provost, and I said, what do you, what's your experience at Cornell students? He said, yes. And, and I, a week later, I read a book by Howard Gardner, who actually gave some suggestions as to why this was and some studies. So, Young people, even our best young people, are risk averse. This is a problem. And hence the pre-professionalism that we're finding. Um, so next factor, I'm, I want to move quickly here, is that I want to suggest that higher education is an unsustainable business model. 19th century, maybe an 18th century model in a 21st century world. Um, by some measures, it's the largest industry in the country, by, at least by one measure, how much cash washes through the income statement. Um, 4,700 institutions of higher learning in the country. Uh, I mean, healthcare is larger as a percentage of GDP, but in terms of the cash, I, I'm told that, or I've read anyway, that higher education, we don't think of it that way because it's disaggregated. There are all these institutions. We don't think of it as big, but it's huge. But it's the last industry to innovate. There hasn't been a significant innovation, according to Clay Christensen at Harvard, in higher education since the GI Bill in 1946. Um, so, and, and I'm gonna suggest later why that might be. It's also highly inefficient, high fixed costs, expensive salaries, union contracts. Um, I, I keep picking on Yale, but I'm gonna do it because it's my alma mater. The, the, the non-exempt employees, or exempt employees, i.e. Uh, faculty, uh, their benefits are 33%. I won't even ask you to guess how much the non-exempt employees are. It's 72%. That's because of a history of bad union contracts, and Yale has $30 billion and they can afford to pay off people, but it's inefficient. Um, insurance, cap maintenance, CapEx, and so on, is, it makes it uh, it's just an inefficient model. Um, Moody's uh, recently, they do an annual survey of American college and universities, and they said Time. this. Time? Minutes. Okay, well, okay, I'm gonna just skip over that. Um, I'm gonna say two more things. Um, higher education is an anti-competitive cartel. Um, I can, you can ask me about that in questions and answer. I think this is a significant structural problem in higher education. And students are unprepared for workforce and in life. I had some concluding observations, which I don't have time for, so I will sit down. Mark. Mark, thank you. Our next presenter is Roya Hakakian. She is a prolific writer who has been widely published, widely acclaimed. She is an editorial board member of World Affairs, a member of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, Guggenheim Prize winner, and also working on a new book at the Wilson Center. Welcome. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, there's good news about my presentation, and there's bad news. Um, and the good news and the bad news are both the same, which is that I will take you out of Europe, out of economics, and um, take you to another region, um, thinking about another topic, and uh, I hope that's all good news and, and that you, after all this, you won't mind um, visiting another topic in a different region. And the region that I'm uh, talking about and thinking about is um, primarily Iran, um, which is the focus of this presentation. In our lives, there are a handful of watershed moments which, if properly recognized, can illuminate the past, change our relationship to the present, or influence, if not determine, the, cur the course of the future. 
For Martin Luther, that moment came 500 years ago when he cut himself loose from the Pope. These watershed events occur when we no longer stand for an idea, a relationship, or the ubiquity of an ongoing order. I experienced such a watershed moment, albeit on a much smaller scale and far less consequential, when I published here in America my first book of poems in Persian. It was a slender volume of carefully selected work called For the Sake of Water, which, as luck would have it, was very warmly received and reviewed. Praise comes a writer's way in a variety of ways, and in my case, one particular praise came via a phone call from a leading critic one night. She lavished me with many encouraging words, and at the end, she offered two bits of advice, both unsolicited. If two, uh, of the two, the most important one was this. Reduce, or better yet, eliminate the mentions of the pronoun I. Too many eyes in this thing, she said. Uh, you need to exercise modesty, or you might be mistaken for a narcissist. I hung up the phone that evening, perfectly intrigued. Here was a high, highly regarded scholar who was not advising me in the ways literary scholars would, or are expected to, to deepen my thinking, or clarify my language, or challenge myself to reach for other bigger ideas beyond what I had already engaged with. In fact, she was advising that I act as my own censor to eliminate references to myself. I distinctly remember thinking that I must dig deeper in the very spot where others wish to uproot me from. As a young woman in a highly patriarchal society, I was not about to give up that vast, cherished personal space that no other place but the blank page afforded me. The I I was asked to eliminate was not only the person that I was at the time, it was also the person I was trying to envision and become. In those days, I was a relatively new refugee to America, hesitantly standing around the edges of the American society and the English language, looking for a way to gracefully and quietly get inside both on a practical level, find a job, on an impractical level, find out what Americans do with their eyes in their poetry. So it was with great literary cockiness for whatever Iranians might not have, be it a nuclear arsenal or a robust economy, and in whatever way America could eclipse Iran, Iran still outperforms everyone else in the realm of poetry or so I thought. After all, Iran has had an ancient poetic tradition that has produced the likes of Rumi, America's number one best-selling poet, and Omar Khayyam. But as my relationship with my adoptive language began to evolve from a refugee's uncertain interaction to, in time, a citizen's confident rapport, I began to wonder the greatest advantage of any writer thinking, working, and reading in two languages with equal ease is that access to two distinct traditions can ward off the provincialism of the imagination, reveal prospects one could not see in a monochromatic world. Reading and comparing, placing one next to the other, it was at last this well-known poem by Emily Dickinson that brought me to a breathtaking halt. I am nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? That makes two of us, don't tell, they'd banish us, you know. There are many ways to fall in love with this poem, but the surest is to view it from the perspective of another literary tradition with little patience for a literary self. I was positively smitten. It was as if all my life, I had lived among brunettes and was suddenly meeting my first blonde. Why was it so electrifying? Soon thereafter, 
I encountered another gem called The Song of Myself, which shook me in the way that only a great work of literature can cause a reader to. After the opening line, I celebrate myself and sing myself, came these moving lines. I know I'm august. I do not trouble my spirit to vindicate itself or be understood. I exist as I am. That is enough. If no other in the world be aware, I sit content. And if each and all be aware, I sit content. Here I must mention that the Iranian mystic poet, a leading Sufi figure named Mansur Halaj, had expressed a similar notion several centuries ago before Whitman in his poetry, but particularly in one famous line, I am God, or I am the truth. But his subsequent imprisonment and execution overshadowed the legacy he might have left if he had lived longer or, gar or had garnered followers. Another compelling encounter was with Theodor Rutke in a poem called My Papa's Waltz. In it, the narrator poet, a child, describes the moment his drunk father is beating him. This is a tormented and highly tragic I, but an I that still sees his personal pain worthy of being told. Those of you who have been born into and raised on English may not fully appreciate these exceptional eyes. These perfectly uncensored eyes, which exercise their right to exist on the page and, are not clear, and clearly are not afraid of being deemed immodest or narcissistic. Don't get me wrong, in the many centuries of Persian poetry, there have been numerous references to the poet narrator self, but they were, for the most part, we's disguised as eyes or eyes which had somehow dissolved and disintegrated into a belief or a passion. There had been heroic eyes which vied to save the king or the nation and perform valorous acts on behalf of the good. There had been enamored eyes, roomy among them, in love, in love with another, god or a mortal, ready to sacrifice all for the sake of the beloved. There had been self-pitying eyes, spurned lover poets who had taken to the bottle and were wistfully plaintive about their unrequited love. There had also been philosophical eyes, as in Omar Khayyam, in which the poetic self looks at the mundane matters of daily existence to draw meaning from them. This is an instructor eye, dispensing advice about life and its highly transient nature. All these references to the poet, in fact, transcend the self or cast it, a, cast it away in the service of something greater. Which is why a small, colorful, and mischievous self like that, that of Emily Dickinson's, with no grand ambitions other than to introduce her deceivingly minor and anonymous seeming self so alluring. Here's not a self trying to transcend itself, performing subhuman acts, or look into the metaphysical world. It does not wish to shed its singularity, but is boldly revealing it and looking for its kindred. A culture that wants to diminish the presence of the individual also needs, among other things, a language that helps that culture to do just that. Persian is no exception. Two particular grammatical qualities of the Persian language help discolor the presence of self or the singular individual on the page. First, Persian allows for the personal pronouns to be absorbed into the verb. Rather than saying, for instance, I know, the I can be eliminated and instead a tiny suffix, a single letter, can be attached to the end of the verb to reveal who the subject of the sentence is. In short, if you're trying, if you're not reading or listening carefully in Persian, you may miss the suffix and therefore not be clear as to who the person or persons is or are. This simple trick of language does the work that an apostrophe performs in English, but the English apostrophe shortens the verb, not the pronoun. 
In other words, in English, it is the action that gets downsized, not the person. In a secondary way, Persian diminishes the emphasis on the individual by eliminating some key details, including doing away with gender distinction. Both she and he are assigned the same pronoun in Persian, which of course causes a basic ambiguity. In conversation, save the mention of the person's name, unless the listener pointedly asks who the, person, who the third person is, a he or a she, it will remain a mystery. This ambiguity has had advantages and disadvantages. Under highly censorious and religiously strict circumstances, a poet like Rumi, by most accounts a gay man in a highly homophobic era, was able to get away with writing, about, writing love poetry because at the end of the day, the beloved he referred to was often a neutral being, which luckily for him, the authorities decided was not another man, but God. And when he spoke of the beloved, the ambiguities of the language kept the nature of that love a perfect mystery. So we have all that we have from Rumi in great part due to a grammatical glitch. But something far greater than mere ambiguity is at work here. The absence of gender differentiation discolors the individual. What is it? A man? A woman? No one knows. A mortal as in a lover or an immortal being like God? The language will leave us guessing. How the absence of specificity, this tiny touch that ever so innocuously turns something material into something vague and nearly immaterial, is a toxic turn which I cannot get into. Suffice it to say that authoritarian regimes always need, uh, need it because they need sacrifice to carry out their missions and to get their subjects to do so, they must rupture the attachment of the citizenry to the actual physical world um, to begin with in language. None of this would be more than esoteric nitpicking or merely Persian literally inside baseball were it not for an enigma that has been lingering. Why is it that Iran, with so much potential, always seems on the brink, but never quite makes it? Politically speaking, the 2009 peaceful uprisings that came to be known as the Green Movement, and surely sparked the flames of uprisings in other parts of the Middle East within a year, never culminated in a democratic change. The slogan that was heard the loudest in, in the days of the protest in Iran was, where is my vote? In retrospect, the better question would have been perhaps, where is I? If the structure of a language is such that it softens or discolors the individual presence of the writer, then how does the thinking about or articulating the desire for the self take shape? If the, place, if the self has no space on the page, if the individual cannot claim a rightful place in language, can the society make any room for him or her? Recently, there have been calls for the necessity of a Martin Luther in Islam. Is such a figure, in fact, a necessity or a remedy? I don't know. But that Luther, Luther if he's coming, will need to contend with a reform not only in religion, but also in language. Thank you. Gloria, thank you very much. Barnaby Marsh is going to bring all of this together in a few minutes. He, Barnaby is the founding partner at St. Partners. He also is an expert on philanthropy and uh, has been an advisor across the globe on philanthropic uh, projects. He's been a senior executive at the John Templeton Foundation and is also an expert in decision sciences and risk. Barnaby, it's all yours. Thank you, Charles. I'm mindful that we're over time and um, I'll try to keep this very brief. <clears throat> I think we heard uh, from all the speakers uh, they very nicely put this dilemma between the power of the individual and the power of the community, and whether that community is seen as the culture or traditions that help guide communities. But one piece that 
seems to be to be almost the hidden piece there is the communication, how people communicate. And the last speaker touched upon that, that briefly. Um, communications over the last few thousands of years have they've evolved a lot and in different ways, um, you know, from oral tradition to books, from Luther, uh, age of mass communications, and then now an age of omni-communications, just omnidirectional communications. And what that's enabled is a lot of new, um, I think, people to self-identify, um, to gather together into uh, associations in ways that would have been unimaginable uh, even even a few decades ago. So my question really to start off for, for the different panelists is uh, in this context of uh, uh, omnidirectional communication, are we seeing the emergence of, let's say, increased tribalism or something between the individual and the society at large where interest groups um, and can bind together better, debate each other in different ways and create perhaps more excitement for society in terms of competition and variation of ideas, but also maybe more danger, as um, Mark Berner was alluding to with Martin Rees's uh, Our Final Century. So I just want to have that as a, as a quick question for reflection here. Um, are there thoughts in, in a sort of a, a neo-tribal society, uh, what role education, you know, plays and could play. Mark? Do you want to push on that? Are we doing fine <clears throat> It's a form of representation. Languages are a form of representation. And if you look at ways of knowing and ways of being and ways of doing, they're ways of representing what we know. And I think we have to learn as many languages as possible in order to describe what it is we want to know or what we know. Uh, mathematics is a language. Mm -hmm. um, architecture is a language. Engineering, um, uh, drama, uh, acting, um, the media. Um, and as I said in my um, mini talk here, um, <clears throat> languages do merge uh, in the end. They merge under suffering. They merge in the way in which we recognize we're all human, uh, in, in effect. Mm -hmm. And we all suffer, um, as I said, in the end all languages merge into our suffering. Mm -hmm. So how, it's, a, it's a complicated question. How the stories and the, the poetry and the, 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 the narrative around this? I mean, this is what education does as well. And Mark, you were giving a lot of stories, I noticed. Didn't yeah, you? yeah, well, I'm going to answer the question, Barnaby, in, um, in the context of my remarks. And, I'm, and where I, had I had an opportunity, one of my concluding observations was that I think higher education is going to stratify more and more over time for a variety of reasons. We're going to see elite institutions become more elite mm -hmm. and, uh, and others become more commoditized for economic and other kinds of reasons. And I think the challenge culturally is going to be not um, at places like this or with people like this. It's going to be with the 98%. Uh, or the others who go to universities for whom education is going to become more and more a commodity um, and, and less and less uh, a liberal. And I think that's a, in the context of Reese's observation, I think that's a significant challenge. And I'm not quite sure how we're going to address that. Anything to add? Um, I, um, I think that um, the digital era has, has given rise to um, electronic tribalism, um, if I understand um, your question correctly. And, um, and I think that generates a dangerous insularity um, and absence of communication between these um, different groups that I think uh, is concerning. I, I just want to mention one more thing. Forms of representation are a form of, uh, of uh, centropy in the fact that there's, it's discursive. So when you learn more languages, as we see here, um, in effect, you are encompassing as much as possible what you're trying to know. So we have to deal with uh, form-restricting content, always. That's the nature of our condition as humans. Excellent. Okay. We're out of time. Uh, we're going to have a break now. Um, but thanks very much. <laughs>